Well, good evening and welcome back for tonight's special missions emphasis. And it is a delight to have a time of year when we focus on the Great Commission, particularly to the regions beyond, to where people especially have never heard. So let's take our hymnals and sing of that great challenge to send the light, the blessed gospel light. Number 656, let's stand together as we sing tonight. As the call comes ringing o'er the restless waves, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the, light. the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine. Well, good evening and welcome to our services this evening. We're so glad and so thankful that you are here with us as we continue the uh, first day of our missions conference. We're off to a great start and tonight we're kind of flipping roles. Uh, this morning we heard ministry update from the Spillmans and um, uh, Philip Carnes preached for us and tonight they're going to do the opposite. They're going to, uh, Philip Carnes is going to present his ministry and, uh, excuse me, he's going to preach did it, it flipped, I flipped it twice. And the Spillmans are going to present their ministry. I want to remind you that after the service tonight, please come over to the gym. We're going to have a little ice cream social. We've got cake and ice cream. A chance for you just to, just to fellowship with each other and especially with our missionaries. Uh, spend some time with them and get to know them. If you haven't done so, out on the uh, center table in the foyer, the round table, there are uh, bulletins that are, that are based on the missions conference. They give you the schedule. They give you a little biography of each of our missionaries. Uh, pick one of those up, please. Also, I noticed that a good number of the prayer cards have been picked up. That is great. If they all disappear, no problem. We'll print more. Uh, we would love to have you praying for our missionaries. And so if, you're, if you'll uh, pray for them, please go ahead and pick one of those up as well. They're also out there. Reminder, this Wednesday and Thursday, we will be um, praying especially for our uh, missionaries and for those who are persecuted. Wednesday night will be a focus on the persecuted Christians. We'll be praying for them. Uh, Micah Self will be there. Uh, he'll be presenting his ministry. He's going to India. There's one area of great persecution. And then uh, we'll be praying. Uh, we'll be having a little presentation uh, from Voice of the Martyrs and as well as taking time to pray. And then Thursday, we'll be taking time to pray for our supported missionaries and for the missionaries who are with us this week. So we would appreciate if you can't make it in person, please join us on Zoom. Uh, and we want to spend some time this week praying uh, for missionaries, for mission work, and for uh, the people of God, uh, especially those in persecuted countries. So we're, it's a great start this week, but we're looking forward to a lot more throughout the week. A uh, reminder that this week coming weekend is the father-son camp out up at Camp Grace. So if you are interested in that or you have more questions about that, please check with Pastor Stedman. Not only is he going up with his sons, but he's also preaching. So I think he has a pretty good idea of what's going on. So check with him if you have any questions about that and you can uh, get up there. Reminder also this Saturday, 11 o'clock, we have the memorial service for Greg Watson. 
Uh, we're so thankful for his testimony of what God did in his life. We're going to remember that. Uh, we're so thankful that he is now uh, with the Lord. And uh, so we're going to just remember what God had done in his life and be thankful for that. We're going to remember, remember, remember that at this time. And then we have, of course, the missions conference, as I've talked about. Uh, so just be praying for our missionaries and be asking, you know, what would God have each of us do in missions? Uh, as I mentioned this morning in our ABF, uh, it has been a time when we have seen God work in ways that are not explainable just from a human standpoint. We went through the pandemic. We were shut down for two months. We've had limited ability to do ministry, and we've had to change things. And through all of that, missions giving has increased. I was telling the class, I went back and looked. We have given more for special projects and missions in the last 12 months than we did in the previous 10 years. That is what God has been doing through us. And so thank you for that. We want to keep going. We took on four new missionaries this year uh, in the midst of a pandemic with everything else that you would think would be working against you. God is obviously working with us and through us. We're so thankful for that. So we want to continue that. That's why our theme this week is faith in action. We are seeing the action. And we want all of us to be able to take that next step, uh, whatever it might be. And part of that is getting to know those who are going out uh, in the mission field. And this evening, we're going to have an update from the Spillmans. They're going to be sharing uh, their ministry with us. So I'm JJ, I'm going to invite you to come on up now and um, share with us uh, the ministry. I think you have a video. Could do some presenting. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Evening, folks. It's good to be with y'all. Uh, my name is JJ Spillman. I have with me my wife, Allison. Would you raise your hand? Hi, sweetie. Yeah, absolutely. That's my wife. We've been married a year and a half, a year and five months, and we started deputation in June. Uh, last year, we're missionaries on our way to the country of Ukraine on deputation, and it's neat to see the way the Lord has worked uh, through this last year. Uh, we would say that there are a lot of reasons maybe not to go on deputation yet, maybe to hold off churches close and that sort of thing. Uh, the Lord really just opened the doors from day one when we started uh, there at the very end of June that uh, we've been able to have meetings, a very full schedule, praise the Lord, ever since. We're at 69% of the support we need uh, to move to the field. And so it's exciting to see the Lord can, as questions asked, can the Lord furnish a table in the wilderness? The answer is he, he can, and he can also do it in the middle of COVID too, praise the Lord. And so we have a presentation video, just want to share with you our testimonies really quickly. And after that, give you a short summary of where the Lord has called us to and a testimony along those lines. Sent out of North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California, with the help of BIMI. The country of Ukraine is quite beautiful approximately the size of Texas. Its significant grain production has earned it the name the breadbasket of Europe. The population of Ukraine is nearly 44 million people, the majority of which are Greek Orthodox in belief. The country of Ukraine has two main languages, Ukrainian and Russian. The majority of people in Ukraine remember what it was like to live under Russia in the Soviet Union and do not wish to return to it. They're very kind and hardworking people and they love their families very much. Many of those in Ukraine have learned several different trades through the work that is available. They seek success on earth, but do not realize that success on earth will not guarantee them a spot in heaven. My family started attending church when I was three years old. At the age of five, I made a profession of faith in Christ, but it wasn't until camp of my seventh grade year that I was finally convicted and I received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. When I was in high school, we attended a youth conference at North Valley Baptist Church where God began working on my heart about surrendering to full-time Christian service. In 2013, the Lord opened the doors for me to go to Bible college. There, I was able to be a part of the bus route, soul winning, and many more opportunities to serve Christ. During my sophomore year of Bible college, the Lord began working on my heart about missions. It was not until our missions conference that the Lord truly spoke to me and I was convicted about surrendering to full-time service on the mission field. After graduating college, I was able to work at Bible Baptist Church in Marysville, California as a school teacher. I was born to John and Don Spillman, veteran missionaries to the country of Ukraine. We moved there when I was three and a half and at the age of five, I trusted Christ as my personal savior. I'm so thankful that I got to grow up in the ministry with my parents there in Ukraine. 
while in Ukraine, God began working on my heart to surrender to preach. And I did so during my junior year in high school. I did not know at the time, however, that God's plan for me was missions until I'd gotten to Bible college. And while at Bible college, God not only showed me that it was missions that he wanted me to serve him in, but also missions to my home country of Ukraine. One day while in a village, I was handing out invitations with my father for a revival service we were planning that evening. We stopped to speak to a lady who was working outside in her garden. When we had told her what the invitation was, she immediately rejected us and said that she did not want it. She was born Orthodox, would live Orthodox, and would one day die in Orthodox. I was so sad leaving her house that day because what she truly was saying was that she was born a sinner, she would live a sinner, and she would one day die a sinner without Christ. We held the service that night, and many folks came. Some drove in their cars, motorcycles. Some rode in horse-drawn carts over rough terrain for several miles just to come to church. The people of Ukraine are hungry and thirsty for the gospel. They just need someone who can take it to them. When I came back to the States to study at Bible College in 2014, a war was brewing in Ukraine. People of Ukraine had protested and overthrown their current president, who was pro-Russian in his policies and blocking their application to join the European Union. It was at this time that Russia took the opportunity to seize several portions of Ukrainian land, the Crimean Peninsula, and eastern portions of Ukraine. There is still fighting going on in the eastern portions of Ukraine, and thousands have died on both sides. There is a war going on in the country of Ukraine, hidden from many people's eyes, but it's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. It's a war for the hearts and souls of the men, women, and children of the country of Ukraine. And it's a war that Christ won at the cross of Calvary. Many, however, do not know that there is victory in Christ. Since Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union, God has opened the doors for the gospel in Ukraine. Missionaries and nationals have had greater freedoms to give the gospel and we've seen many, many people saved. The problem is that there are so many that still do not know Christ as their personal Savior. Millions are lost in that country. And though they may have heard of the name of Jesus, they don't know what he can do to save their souls. There's still so much work to be done in the country of Ukraine. And the laborers are few. There are so many people dying each day that do not have the gospel in their city or village. And they need someone who would just take it to them. Would you please prayerfully consider supporting us as we go to reach the lost in Ukraine? Amen. That's a, uh, a quick summary of my wife and I's testimonies and the things the Lord has done for us. Um, I just wanted, before we go any further, say uh, thank you, Pastor uh, Brother Malik and to Pastor Sen for having us in and to you folks for uh, bringing us in and for caring for missions. Uh, you may not already know it yet. I mentioned it a little bit to the Sunday school class. You have already had an influence on my ministry and the ministry in Ukraine that we look forward to working in uh, because of Neighborhood Bible Time. Uh, Lord used that program very extensively in my life and opened the doors through that to be able to go to Ukraine and Russia and do Bible clubs. And I just I just share it really quickly. In Ukraine, uh, the idea of, of Baptist uh, carries, for the most part, at least when my folks first got there, a very negative connotation. It's not that we had necessarily done anything wrong, uh, but the Orthodox priests, knowing that missionaries would be coming in once the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, did their very best to spread rumors about Baptists and how we were a cult, we were a sect, uh, we eat our children, and that sort of thing. And they, they did their very best to spread those. And for the longest time, uh, you would not be able to get a child even into come into a Baptist church just to visit. Uh, the idea of having a Bible club inside uh, would not have worked over there at all until the summer of the Lord used us to bring neighborhood Bible time over there. And uh, we had a lot of kids, praise the Lord, come about 40, I want to say 40 to 50 uh, that first year. But the next year that they continued having Bible clubs uh, using a similar format, uh, we had upwards of 90 children come into our building and be ministered to and to be worked to uh, and given the gospel to uh, because of the work that you folks have done here already in the States and uh, sharing the gospel and caring for missions that way. And so I just want to say thank you for that. 
I also wanted to add to the city that we're going to. The city we're going to is Sumi, Ukraine. It's in the northeastern part of the country. It is um, about 11 hours drive distance from where I grew up. So it's on the opposite side of the country from where I grew up. And it's a city of a quarter of a million people that need the gospel. The uh, first time I heard about Sumi was uh, from a young orphan girl uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the last year that I was there before coming back to study at Bible college, uh, we had an orphanage ministry on Saturdays, and we would go there, do Bible lessons, and sing songs with them. And uh, really, it was a neat opportunity to work with so many young children, because in Ukraine, uh, when you go to an orphanage, you may not stay at that orphanage the whole time growing up. They cycle them uh, from orphanages within the city, but also orphanages from other cities. And so we had a, a rotation of children that would come in, and we were able to minister to a lot of children that way. Well, this one, there was this one girl, about eight years old. She came in. I immediately fell in love with the workers, was there faithfully every Saturday, uh, singing the songs, learning the lessons. And uh, one Saturday, she met us at the gate. I met all the workers at the gate. And she said, Mr. JJ, Mr. JJ. I said, what, what is it? And I used her name. And uh, she said, I'm leaving. I thought, okay, this is good news, right? She's, she's moving. She's probably getting adopted. She's a cheery child. Who wouldn't want to adopt her? I said, okay, are you, are you getting adopted? What's going on? And she looked up at me and she said, no, I'm not getting adopted, but they're moving me back to the city that I was born in, Sumi, Ukraine. I have an orphanage up there. Would you please come visit me in Sumi? And my heart sunk. I'd never heard of the city before. I didn't know necessarily what she was talking about, but I did know this is she wanted someone to love her and she wanted someone to be there for her. And I couldn't do that, but I knew the Lord could. And a couple of years after being in Bible college, I was praying. I knew the Lord had already called me to go back to Ukraine and was praying, Lord, where do you want me to go? And a trio got up and sang a song. It's called, Tell Me of God's Love One More Time. A story about a child who wants to hear the story of the gospel one more time. How someone so incredible like Jesus would love them so much that he would leave heaven just to come and die. Uh, there was nothing down here for Jesus to gain except for you and me. He had everything. And thousands of years before you or I were born, he chose to give all of that up so that he could come and pay the penalty for our sin because of how much he loved us. And when I was thinking about that song and the love that was in that song, her image popped up in my mind. Would you please come to sue me? Would you please come to sue me? And I felt like I said, okay, Lord, I think you're pretty clear. Uh, the message is clear. You want me to go to sue me, Ukraine. And it's been delightful to see how the Lord has prepared the way for us. Um, I'd never been there, but this summer, my wife and I, we both were able to take a survey trip. And that was one of the cities uh, we got to visit. We have pictures of it there on the back in our table in our photo book, if you'd like to come look and see a little bit of what Sumi looks like. And we just really appreciate your prayers as we continue deputation uh, to get over there, Lord willing, in May next year. And we'll start in Odessa a couple of years and pick up uh, Russian language and Ukrainian language. So that when we get up to uh, Sumi, we'll be prepared and ready to serve in both languages and be ready to start a church up there. And who knows, uh, maybe God will bring it to pass and we'll be able to cross paths with that young girl again. She'd probably be about 18, excuse me, 19 years old right now. And so she's already out of the system and she's in a very dark world over there. And the best of my knowledge, she's not saved and she needs the gospel again, at least. And there's about 250,000 other reasons in that city. And they all need the gospel. And so we'd appreciate your prayers for us. Come grab a uh, prayer card. Uh, come talk to us at our table. Uh, you all have been so very friendly. And we would just want to say thank you for having us in and allowing us to be able to share this with you all. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, JJ. And Allison, good to have you with us tonight. Uh, great slides. That's what a vision there and burden you, you uh, passed on to us. Uh, also, the MBT connection, the neighborhood Bible time. That's Nate uh, Charles B. Homeshire Jr. was a member of our church here. Had the privilege of preaching his funeral, part of the funeral, and uh, that ministry has had great impact. We were just at the funeral for Kathy Eamon, and uh, it was written out in her obituary how she came to know Christ, and it was at a neighborhood Bible time club here in Colorado. So that ministry has had tremendous impact, and we trust that your ministry will likewise have great impact. Uh, just a couple things, we'll pray. Uh, this is our 30th annual missions conference. That's hard to believe. So 
Uh, we've had uh, 29, 30 out of the last 31 years, we've been able to host a missions conference with the exception being last year. So it's good to be back on track again. And uh, we are thrilled that you're with us. Uh, dates are important, years are important. I think about Pastor Larry, um, he's been here 38 years and he came when he was 42 years old. So 42 plus 38, that's a new number. That's a 70. That's a set. That is people who are 70 are really old, really old. So ow, ow, ow. So, so thank you, Larry, for your 38 years here when you came at age 42. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pray for us and then I'll continue with our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the challenge that we were just uh, presented with, with the uh, country of Ukraine. Um, maybe only a few folks in this service here have ever been there and even have a first-hand view of what uh, was just described. And uh, we thank you for JJ's background, his family, and their willingness to go. And I'm sure his parents prayed that if it was your will that you would bring him back to this country, that country to minister. And Lord, what a blessing that he's coming back and that you've given him a bride, a helpmate um, to co-labor in a very needy world. So Lord, bless them and their ministry. We pray for the uh, 31 more percent of support that they need, that you'd raise it and that you'd hurl them, cast them out into the field as white uh, under the harvest. And Lord, you would use them mightily. Thank you for this week you've given us to especially focus on uh, other workers in the, in, the, in the vineyard, we pray that you bless uh, this service, Brother Phil, later when he preaches. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I just wanted to say, Pastor Larry, you're looking really good for 80. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we did last year that we started, uh, it, was, it was primarily because of COVID, but it's something that uh, really was not only well received, but I think it was something that worked out very well was to hear from our missionaries via video, our supported missionaries. And so tonight we're gonna get the first of those. We've got uh, four or five lined up for this year, uh, for this week. And tonight we're gonna hear from uh, Dan Baker in Australia. And so um, if you're not aware of it, he'll probably present this if you're not aware of it, the government has just told them they're going to lose their church building because they want to widen the highway that's there. And they're, they're, they're trying to work out whether they're going to be paid for it or whether they're getting a new building or whatever it is. That's definitely a prayer request, but they have a lot that's going on there. So if we could uh, see the update for the bakers. Good day. We are the Bakers, Dan, Amy, Josh, Emma, and Genevieve, serving the Lord in Cairns, Queensland, Australia. I serve primarily as a pastor teacher at Trinity Baptist Church. In addition to preaching, I focus on the discipling of new converts and the training of new leadership. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm homeschooling and doing distance education with our three children, Josh, Emma, and Genevieve. I'm also involved with the ladies and children's ministries at church. I enjoy trying to cook Australian foods like lamb curry and passion fruit slice. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm in year 10 at school. I play ultimate frisbee with a group in town and I take ukulele lessons. I enjoy getting out into the community and witnessing with friends on the weekend. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm in year eight and I'm taking piano lessons. I enjoy helping with the children's ministries at church. Hi, I'm Danny. I'm in year two. Mom is homeschooling me. I like to go to church and see my friends.
December of 2016, God led our family 14,000 miles from the temperate east coast of the U.S. to the tropical northeast coast of Australia. For our first 18 months in Australia, we lived in the small oceanside town of Cardwell with a population of 1,250. We ministered there at Cardwell Baptist Church under Tracy and Debbie Minnick. Pastor Minnick graciously allowed me to share the preaching and teaching load in the adult services. He also taught me how to do youth group and teach religious education classes in the public schools. During 2017, we began a weekly Bible study for migrant farm workers from Vanuatu who came to our area for seasonal work on the banana farms. On the family side, Josh and Emma loved going to school on Fridays at a small Christian school 40 minutes away while I homeschooled them the other four days of the week under the school's direction. During our time in Cardwell, we learned the ins and outs of Queensland's rural culture and ministry. In July of 2018, under the guidance of our mission board, GFA, we moved to the city of Cairns with a population of 150,000. Cairns is situated between the Great Barrier Reef and the mountainous rainforest. We currently minister at Trinity Baptist Church under the direction of Pastor Stephen Mock. Since 2005, Pastor Mock's vision for the greater Cairns region has been to plant a church. My burden to see believers developed and trained for ministry, whether to full-time or lay ministry, goes hand in hand with Pastor Mock's vision of church planting. To train believers, I've already facilitated various classes like hermeneutics and Old Testament survey. An older man in the church, Simon, took these classes with me. Simon faithfully serves as the church cleaner, engages in the weekly evangelism ministry, and contributes to the men's Bible study. He also preaches at times on Wednesday nights. He's always hungry to further his understanding of God's Word and to handle it accurately. Nathan also took classes with me. Nathan is currently training as an auto electrical apprentice, and he desires to learn to be able to preach the word effectively. Nathan currently ministers in our youth group through leading games and teaching the juniors class. I'm regularly preaching in our Sunday and Wednesday services and occasionally teaching in our youth group. At church, I've taught and assisted in the bi-weekly ladies' Bible study, as well as teaching the children in Sunday school. I am blessed when the ladies and children grow in their understanding of the Word. On the home front, I've been homeschooling our children through our state of Queensland, and now I'm continuing to homeschool Genevieve while supervising Josh and Emma in the high school distance education program of a Christian school. In 2020, I was diagnosed with cancer but praise the Lord, after having surgery, I was declared cancer-free. I thank God for his mercy to me in this. Perhaps the most exciting aspect of ministry at Trinity Baptist Church is discipling people. I've been able to be involved in discipling men like Ryan and Ralph. Ryan grew up at Trinity, but as a young adult, he lived in sin far from God. Then in 2019, he turned from his sins and accepted Christ as his Savior. In 2020, he was baptized and joined the church. During this time, he brought his friend Ralph with him to church, and Ralph repented of his sins and called on Christ for salvation. These two young men witness in their secular workplaces and are always asking for prayer for their unsaved workmates and family members. It's been a joy to see these men grow in the Lord. As we look ahead to 2022 and beyond, we have a burden to help our churches English as a second language speakers. Because Cairns is a very international city, we have people come to our church from Indonesia, China, the Philippines, and various Pacific Islands. These folks struggle to understand English as their second or sometimes third or fourth language. We hope to have English as a second language classes to help them progress to the place where they can profit more fully from the preaching of the word. We also have a burden to teach more classes to build up lay people and to train men for ministry of the word. 
Though none of the men in our church at present are called to full-time pastoral ministry, men like Simon and Nate are already ministering the word in our church. Our long-term goal is to see Australian men as the primary preaching pastors in both the mother and the daughter church. In 2022, we plan to continue Bible studies in the target area for the church plant and organize leaders and families who will go from the mother church to start the church plant. Thank you for your years of prayer and financial support. We desperately need even more intercession if we want to see the Lord visibly work and bless our service to Christ. God led us to Australia, and he continues to lead us as we minister here. Colossians 1, 28 to 29 beautifully states our purpose for ministry. As Paul did, so we seek to do. Him, that is Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this we toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within us. We covet your prayers for God to energize us as we seek to make disciples for him in Cairns, Australia. Amen. It's wonderful to see God working as far away from here about as you can get. <laughs> I can't imagine anywhere further. I think the uh, longest flight in the world goes to Australia, as I recall. So wonderful to get that update from the bakers. We're going to take our hymnals again and turn to hymn 655. Now, some of you will remember the words to So Send I You, and these are not quite the same that you might have grown up with. Someone else has written some additional words to this same tune and on this same theme, but this is by grace made strong, so a little bit more uplift to the word. So let's stand together as we sing hymn 655, So Send I You. So send I you, by grace made strong to triumph, or hosts of hell, or darkness, death, and sin, my name to bear, and in that name to conquer. So send I you, my victory to win. So send I you, to take to souls in bondage. The word of truth that sets a captive free. Of sin to lose less debtors, so send I you to bring the lost to me. So send I you my strength to know in weakness, my joy in grief, my perfect peace in pain. presence so send I you eternal fruit to gain so send I you to bear my cross with patience and then one day with joy to lay it down to hear my voice well done my faithful servant come share my throne kingdom and my crown. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Larry and Karen will come and minister to us. Now is the time 
we must not delay. Jesus may come before the day's done. What will you do today? What you will do to others seems on. Compelled to take the gospel abroad. Waiting on God to go to the poor. Have you reached out to your neighbor next door? What will you do for missions? Now is the time we must not delay. Jesus may come before the day's done. What will you do today? What will you do to win the lost? Time and efforts, your means to exhaust. What will you give of that you can't keep? Rather to gain in heaven to reap. What will you do for missions? Now is the time we must not delay. Jesus may come before the day's done. What will you do today? Thank you, Lawrence and Karen, for that special music. And sorry, my math was so bad. I can't believe that. So, so you came here age 32 plus 38 equals 70. So somehow we get to 70. So thank you for that special music. Uh, in just a moment, Missionary Philip Carnes will speak, and then Stephanie, we'll have you do the music at the end, and uh, we'll use that as a time for prayer at the end of the service. Again, great to have you, great to have the Carnes. If you don't know the connection, uh, his wife is the daughter of Ken and Carol Crane, members of our church. So uh, this is a nice family uh, opportunity to be together. So, Brother Philip, good to have you. Lord bless you. Would you come and preach to us? Oh, good evening. Good to see you all again here. Um, your brother JJ's uh, video and introduction, I almost feel like I should say amen and go have ice cream. Uh, we'll go ahead and share what, what God's put on my heart for tonight. So, uh, be looking at Luke 9, 56 to 62, for those who wish to try and wish to follow along. Luke 9, 56 through 62. So during my first summer volunteering with MFI, and on my first trip to Haiti, it was a planned overnight. So I got to see some of the places that I'd be serving in the future that I didn't know I'd be there yet. And we're spending the night at one of the mission houses. And there are a couple of things I remember from that night. It'd been a really long day, we're tired. I was bunking with one of the, with the captain that I've been flying with that day. I remember a bullet hole in the window over my bed and a long conversation that we had about missions. He was kind of hoping I'd join up at some point with missionary flights. He didn't want to see all the training I'd had go to waste is what he'd said later on. But one line that stuck with me from that conversation that night was, Phil, there's some who talk of faith, and then there are those who step out and walk by faith. That was almost 18 years ago. It still sticks in my mind. Jesus had a lot of disciples that were called to walk by faith. The 12 come to mind right away, his closest friends. But there are others that followed him from town to town. And the Bible doesn't always speak very much about them, but you, you hear that they're there. I'd like to stop and look at some of the ones that Luke talks about here in this passage. And they went to another village, and it came to pass that as they went along the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever thou goest. His first disciple I want to look at is the eager disciple. He was excited. He wanted to follow Christ. The guy sounded like a perfect follower. Let me go. Let me go. I want to go do it. We often think it's good to follow Christ without counting the cost. Many times that's even discussed in church, and there are times where that needs to happen, where you, you just follow with what God tells you to do and don't think about it. 
Oftentimes in a long-term situation, if you leave and you don't count the cost, you can end up disillusioned in the long run because it sounded fun when it started, but then you get into it and realize it's a lot of hard work. Jesus had some pretty straight words for him to say. We see that in the next verse that uh, he said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. The, uh, as I read this and consider what Jesus just said, if you're going to want to follow Jesus, you want to consider following Jesus, you have to be willing to give up things that people consider normal. Things like a home sometimes, sometimes a normal income, and at times a normal place to work. So a lot of missionaries live by faith. That means what God brings in, that's what they live on. It's not normal. Most people go to work for 40, 50 hours a week. They have a set income or set hour they make. You know, as a missionary, you, you live on what God gives you. He's never late, seldom early. It's been a cool walk to see him use different things to provide. A normal place to work. When I was working in aviation as a mechanic, we had a hangar, electricity, shade. When I got my sales pitch for MFI, we were out on a ramp at Palm Beach. No hanger, no shade. We had one electrical cord through a fence, one garden hose through a fence that a flight school had generously allowed us to use because the airport commission had taken away the office that MFI had at the time at the airport. It got better. They said, expect very long days. Flight days that'll start before sunrise, go well after sunset. Late evenings working on maintenance and loading airplanes. All weather, rain, cold, wind, we'll be working in it. Oh, and by the way, the political situation in Haiti is blowing up. We don't know if we'll still be flying there because the two governments don't get along. And Palm Beach wants to get rid of us, so we're not even sure where we're going to be. Still want to join? I remember talking with the, the board there and said, well, I'll cast my lot with the others. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this disciple. But I would like to think that he went on to be a wiser person and followed Christ. Eagerness and excitement are great things, but stop and count the cost. We continue on and see in verse 59, he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. The second disciple is a reluctant disciple. He was called by the voice of Jesus. How often do we say, if only I could hear the voice of Jesus, I would go. I'd do what he says. Here it is. Here's someone who Jesus called, and he hesitated. He had obligations and things that he needed to do. Taking care of one's parents in that day was a major expectation. Whether the father was actually close to death or whether it was to complete the obligation before he did what Christ had called him to do, the Bible doesn't tell us. But what it does imply is that Jesus says that there is an importance to the call. And we see that in the next verse. And he says, Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. To follow Christ requires a radical commitment sometimes it's not always seen what that will imply or require. And this point it was saying that you need to do right now is preach the kingdom of God and let your other commitments go by the way. I used to equate preach with pastor. Everyone calls the pastor preacher. So when I kept hearing go and preach, and preach the kingdom, I kept going, no, 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 that's not what I'm called to do. That's not what I need to do. I had a professor that every morning he'd walk into class and go, we're all called to preach. And I'd sit there and go, I don't know. I learned and studied the word preach. It could also be translated proclaim or to carry a message. 
So yes, we're all called to preach. We all have a message to share. Sometimes we think about it, sometimes we don't. But there will always be a message that we are proclaiming every day. That message for most of us should be, Christ saved me from my sins and has worked in my life. And let me tell you how and why. And this would be a great reason for why you should trust in Christ too, is that we're sinners. That's a message that all of us can preach in our work, in our church, and every day. I digress a little bit there. Um, commitment is important and is needed to do to follow Christ as a commitment. Early in my ministry, I was at a very hard place, and a pastor took me out for coffee. And in the great wisdom of Starbucks, at that coffee, we had a long conversation about a lot of stuff. I don't remember much about it. I do remember the coffee cup. I'm going to read it to you here. The irony of commitment is that it is deeply liberating. In work, in play, in love, the act frees you from the tyranny of your own internal critic, from the fear that likes to dress itself up and parade around as rational hesitation. To commit is to remove your head as the barrier from your life. No, it's not exactly scripture, but at the time, that's kind of what I needed to hear. The, uh, I was a point where I was really struggling with living by faith, continuing on, staying and going on with missionary flights. And everything in my head was rational. It made sense to me. But yet the call was go to missionary flights over and over and over for several years you are going to be at missionary flights. And as I read that coffee cup, the commitment really struck me. And God's like, I haven't released you. Commitment, an insane commitment. It removes all those other doubts, all those other hesitations to follow and do what God's called you. Being a disciple means being committed and all in. Verse 61, we see another <clears throat> disciple that is standing before Christ. And Christ in verse 61 says, follow, oh, I, he comes to him and says, I will follow, follow thee, but let me first go and bid farewell, which are at my house. I will follow you, Christ, but first, Sound familiar to anyone? I'll follow you, but first, let me make some money. But first, I want to get married. But first, I want to have kids. But first, I want to raise the kids. I want to retire. Then I'll follow Christ, or then I'll do what Christ has called me to do. Or I'll get involved with ministry then. I get to meet a lot of people, Christians around, some Christians, some not. But for the Christians I meet, some of them, well, several of them say, wow, what did you get into? How did you get into that? I meet him at the hangar. I meet him on the street. I meet him at air shows. And as we talk, discuss how I got into it and what I do. Sorry, I'm falling off here. Um, different test questions come up. Different discussions that we do or we speak with. And it's, we watch them shake their head and start to walk away. Because when rubber meets the, meets the road, it can be difficult. It is difficult. A lot of them will have the same combinations of, I want to do this first, or, you know, I have to take care of this. Or, but, you know, it, it comes down to that faith that I'm going to commit to what Christ has called us to do, and I'm going to go do it. The but first people, their conversations a lot of times haunt with me. I'll hear it in my head at night because they're the ones that you talk with and they seem so interested and so 
so curious, so excited about it. But they walk away. One of the uh, conversations that's hung in my head now for several years, I was at an air show and uh, was talking with another pilot for a major airline, and he sounded so good. We would ask him about his testimony and shared about his faith and how he came to know Christ. Wow, that's usually a really difficult one for people to share whenever I meet him at air shows. Oh, yeah, I go to church, uh, like every Sunday or Christmas and Easter, you know. Um, so, you know, we talked with him, and he's like, what do I need to do to get involved with this? And we talked more about it. I even asked him some questions. He sounded like he had a servant's heart. Another thing that's not always common, you ask guys, so what if you're not doing airplane stuff? Let's say it's a Wednesday and we got to sweep the floor or the toilet's broken. We got to go change the macerator pump. And oh, by the way, it's still full. Get a coffee cup out and dip it out. <clears throat> he didn't flinch at that. He's like, well, that's what it takes to get done. He sounded so good. As we got toward the end of the conversation, I said, so when did you want to do this? He said, oh, when I retire. And I asked, so you ever think about retiring early? Nope. He turned around and walked away almost that fast. It's like, oh, wow. Because when he retires, he's going to be the age at which we start to retire out at MFI. And so it's like, you know, you, I'm not real fast on my feet when it comes to comebacks, puns, and all that. But as I thought about it, it's like, wait, wait, don't go. There's so much more here that you'll miss out on. So much more important than whatever money you're going to make. Whatever you're going to be doing. But first, let me do this. But when I retire, don't miss out on what the Lord's doing. When the Lord calls or opens a door in front of you and you feel like you're being tugged into it, that's the time to say yes. Anytime you put a butt in front of it, things start to slow down. Yes, count the cost. But when God opens the door, there should be no buts. Follow through and see where he takes you. There's so much more you can, than you can imagine walking by faith and following where Christ takes you. I'd like to jump uh, or on down to verse 62. Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Strong words, sometimes difficult words. I think Christ was more telling about the commitment level to following Christ, to following him. The... <clears throat> The commitment and the following can look in many different ways. I mean, we can't all be missionaries on the field, but we can be faithful to Christ in our daily lives, our daily work, and praying for the missionaries, being involved with the local church, being involved in the community in Christ's name, and having it known that you're doing it in Christ's name. Christ is looking for the committed disciple, one that'll grab, grab their faith in him, and walk and follow. I'm going to look over into the next chapter here, in verse 10 or chapter 10. And we're going to take some quick looks at 1 through 4 and verses 17 and 23 through 24. Lost the page. After these things, the disciples that God, Christ was talking with, the Lord appointed 70 also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place, whether himself would come. And he said unto them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. It's a great missions conference verse. I've heard it many times. Even here, I've heard it at least twice today. And it is true. The fields are ripe and hungry for the good news of Jesus. 
Pray the laborers to go forth. That's the hard part. Again, but first, but let me first. And it sounds good in the head. Sometimes you have to take your head out of the picture and just commit. He sent them out two by two. I think that's kind of an important piece too. Two people together are so much stronger than just one. The Christian walk, the Christian life is not a, a solo operation. You know, the Bible tells us not to forsake the gathering of believers. We see here Christ sent them out two by two. He did that another time in the Bible, sending them out two by two. There's great assurance and help when you have a second person next to you that you can work with. A little bit of a rabbit trail here. These continued saying, <clears throat> go your ways and behold, I send you forth as lamb, lambs among wolves, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. On this mission, Christ sent him out by faith. Don't take any money with you. Don't carry your purse. Don't take extra clothes. Go by faith on this mission and share that I'm coming. I'm going to skip down a few verses to verse 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto thy name. Not so much the devils, and Christ says that later, but I like the, and the returned with joy. I grew up with my dad as a pastor. For the beginning of my life, the first 10 or 12 years, he was a pastor. He moved from church to church about every two years. He was a good evangelist. He'd take a dying church and he would bring it back to self-supporting. So at the time, I didn't appreciate what he did. At the time, I didn't understand why he did it. All I knew is I moved on my birthday every other because there was a joy. And as I worked missionary flights, I realized there's a joy in serving Jesus. As he'd had mis missionaries come through his church, it may be misperception on my part, but what I remembered the most was suffering. <clears throat> it's hard work, we're suffering for Jesus. And as a young boy, let me just say, I don't like suffering. As a middle-aged person, I still don't like suffering. But that's what stuck with me, was we're suffering for Jesus. What I missed was there's a joy in serving Jesus. There's an excitement in serving Jesus. There is an unbelievable, deep-seated sense of satisfaction knowing that you're doing what God has asked you to do and whatever that profession looks like. <clears throat> One of my most joyous times, I was flying an airplane and a young man came up and sat behind me in the jump seat and we started talking. And as we talked, I realized I, that he came from a Catholic background. And as we talked some more, I asked him, well, not to be mean, but how does the Catholic church say we, that you're saved? He answered, I'm not sure you can know. Oh, okay. So I pulled up my Bible on the iPad, and I pulled up some scripture, and I handed it to him. I said, can you read this? And he took a lot longer than I thought he would. He read the whole chapter. And he looked up, and his eyes were shining. And he said, I never knew I could know. And I showed him some more passages about salvation and faith in Christ. And as he left the cockpit, he was just like, I never knew I could know that I'm saved and to see the joy and the excitement in his face as he came to know that he can know Jesus for himself and be saved from his sins and know he's saved from his sins. 
was just incredible to see that in his face and to see how God worked there. There is a joy in serving Jesus. I think that's getting left out so much is that there's a joy. Is it hard work? Yes. Is it happiness? Not always. Joy is not happiness. I said joy is a deep-seated knowledge that you're doing what God has called you to do, a satisfaction in what you do. There's one more thing that comes up with that joy there. And in verse 23, we see, and he turned him unto his disciples and he said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things that you have seen. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. The prophets, the kings, had the prophecies of the Old Testament, beginning with Moses, of the Messiah to come. We, with the New Testament, we have seen or read, the 70 saw with their own eyes God's Son. We have read of God's Son. We have seen, through reading our eyes, the Old Testament first, pro first coming prophecies fulfilled. These are things that the kings and the prophets foretold of and desired to see, and things that we have been able to read and see and know have happened. What great joy there is in that, to see that what others held as a hope, we see as a fulfillment, and have in our scriptures, whether it's an iPad or printed word, the fulfillment of what the prophets long to see, to be able to see that Christ has made a way to remove that sacrificial system of the Old Testament and place himself as the redemption for our sins and to restore the relationship between us and God. What joy there should be in that and in that message to be able to share it with others. In conclusion, Jesus has called us through his word to commit to being disciples, to walk by faith. And again, that conversation rings in my mind, and I challenge it with y'all. There are those who talk of faith, and then there are those who step out and walk by faith. I will admit, sometimes walking by faith feels like jumping off a cliff to see where you land. But man, what a ride. Which one will you choose? Father, we thank you for being able to share these words. We pray that they'll have an impact on someone's life. We thank you for your scriptures, for being able to see your fulfillment of things promised. We pray that we may go out with joy and service to you and walk by faith, share what you've done for us. We thank you for restoring, providing a way to restore the relationship with, with God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much. Well, as notes, it looks like a cockpit up here. Um, thank you so much for the message, uh, spot on. I just under, have a few words underlined, uh, verse 59, verse 61, me first, me first. Uh, the problem with uh, missions where it's not doing what it should be, where we don't have the impact is when we have our have that focus, me first, me first. Uh, the work does not go forward when that's your focus, but when you seek him first and his kingdom and his righteousness, then, then things go forward. And then uh, the passage that Phil just covered, I have three other words just underlined, classic missionary words in verse two, pray. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers, pray. Uh, it's amazing, we, we seek to borrow the world's recruiting methods for getting people to get involved and to work and be missionaries. But uh, the best recruiting process is, is prayer, seeking the Lord. And uh, he is very good at nudging people's hearts, working people's hearts to, for them to will and to do of his good pleasure and, and to serve. We do need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. So the word pray, and then you have uh, verse three, which Phil just covered, go, go your ways. And it's not going to be easy. And I really appreciate the emphasis that he gave us tonight that 
You got to count the cost. You got to be committed. Uh, this is not easy. There are obstacles. There are wolves. There are going to be uh, adversaries and, and, and challenges, but we need to go. We need to go. And then finally, verse seven there, I have the little word uh, give uh, underlined. And uh, he's talking about folks giving to these workers. So uh, pray, go, give, very common message, words you hear in, in this context of a missions conference. So uh, this evening, I'm going to have Stephanie come and just quietly play through her offertory or, or message. And I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and hearts for a few moments as we close out our service, that you would pray, that you'd pray uh, to the Lord of the harvest, Lord, hear my, send me. You want me to uh, make some adjustments in my life? Are you working my heart uh, to be involved further in the work here or elsewhere? And I think missions conferences are a great time to do a spiritual tune-up to make sure that we're yielded and surrendered to the Lord. I think of the word going, you know, wow, go your ways. Um, what is your involvement? What are you doing for the Lord? Uh, time is so short, and uh, we need to maximize our time, redeem the days, redeem the time for the days certainly are, are evil. And then as we go further into missions this week, you know, what, what, what would the Lord have us give? What is our, what is our part in that? And uh, Pastor Brian's already commented on how the church has really responded through a difficult time in, in supporting missions. And I'm so thankful to see, to see a church family that cares for missionaries, make sure their needs are met. You've done a fantastic job. But what, what would the Lord have me do now um, as it relates to giving, as it relates to going and being involved, as it relates to praying for missionaries? So let's just take a few moments here and spend a little time with the Lord. Uh, Stephanie, if you would play, and we'll just bow our heads and hearts, and I'll close in prayer in just a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good Lord's Day you've given to us. We thank you for this passage that was shared with us this evening. And Lord, how often we give excuses before you as to why we can't serve or why we have such uh, limitations. And Lord, we see that we put ourselves first, me first, and we, we do not uh, fulfill what you've created us to do. So Lord, forgive us for our failures Forgive us for our shortcomings, our sin, where we uh, have missed, uh, the, missed the opportunities that, that bring such joy to your heart and actually joy to the servant, as was just illustrated in the message. Lord, we, you've told us the best recruiting tool method is prayer, and to pray to you that you would work in people's hearts 
and uh, to send them forth into, into the work. And Lord, there's so many needs here and around the world, and may we be diligent to pray. Uh, we think of um, Northwest Baptist Missions right now with uh, Pastor Ron Eamon losing his wife, and she played such a significant role in the mission. We know that he is conflicted uh, doing a church plant right now, as well as directing a mission and uh, really a model unsustainable. We know, Lord, he's praying about the next step, if he should uh, resign from the mission board and simply continue with the church plant, or whether he should seek for a pastor there in Grantsville and continue with the mission. So, Lord, uh, either way, uh, there's a worker needed. And so we pray for that. We pray for those who will be going out to Utah next week, that it would be a great encouragement to Pastor Edwards and to the many Northwest workers. Lord, we've been praying for campus ministries here that you would uh, work in hearts and that we would see you put it in someone's heart to lead a, a campus ministry here at the mines or at CU or the Front Range. Thank you for the young college student who just came and said that you're working in his heart to start a, a cross impact at the mines. We pray, Lord, that if that is your will, that this young man would fully count the cost and would be willing to unashamedly preach the gospel and organize Bible studies there on the campus where there are those uh, who would oppose a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview of origins, of life, of salvation. So, Lord, we pray for workers there on these campuses. We think of church plants that are needed in the need of workers. We know that there are churches without pastors, and you've told us uh, here to pray for that, for you to, to send forth the laborers. And so, Lord, if we're lacking workers, may we pray. You've told us to go, and you, you didn't paint a, a picture that was unrealistic. You told us that when we go, there will be wolves that will want to devour the sheep and shepherds. And so we know that we're going out into a, a ferocious war, a conflict, but thank you for giving us the necessary armor to put on so that we don't have to be taken out of the work by some fiery dart hitting our, our, our vital spiritual organs. So Lord, help us to go, help us to uh, be as wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. We know that uh, likely if your son tarries, that things are only going to escalate in persecution towards Christians. So help us be bold, help us be unashamed, help us, Lord, to, to go. When it comes to giving, may we be faithful. When there's a need and you tug on our heart, may we respond, may we trust you. We uh, ask that you would increase our faith. I pray, Lord, for this church that we would do things where we're just trusting you and that we would see you do exceedingly and abundantly above anything we ask or pray according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, help us, Lord, not just simply to attempt ministries that are within our our budgets and within our abilities and within our experiences. May we trust you to do great things, things beyond our capacity that you've created. Lord, help us here to set aside the me first. Help us, Lord, to pray. Help us to go and help us to give. Lord, bless our fellowship here tonight uh, down in the gym. Uh, may this be a sweet time with our missionary guests and with one another. Again, thank you for this good day you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, thank you so much for coming. We're going to have our missionaries work their way down to the gym ahead of us. And then uh, if your schedules have been carved out to join us, please join us tonight for uh, refreshments down in the gym. And uh, please get a chance to say hi to our missionaries. You are dismissed. <laughs>